What up, y'all? I'm Dr. CBS. And I'm Dr. Layla Brown. And this is A Little LBI. All right, y'all. So today we are joined by a fan favorite, the people's historian, Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, Dr. Gerald Horn is the Morris Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's the author of more than 45 books, including White Supremacy Confronted, U.S. Imperialism and Anti-Communism versus the Liberation of South Africa from Rose to Mandela, and The Bittersweet Science, Racism, Racketeering, and the Political Economy of Boxing. All right, so welcome, Dr. Horn. Well, thank you for inviting me. Of thank course, you. okay, so today, so when we had you on the Talk Black last week or a few weeks ago, you gave us a rundown of the international situation, but today we're talking about all things domestic, which of course, as you point out, has an international context. And so when we spoke about uh, what to talk about today, you sent us some homework, an article <laughs> to read. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the article, uh, What Thurgood Marshall Taught Me by uh, Stephen L. Carter that was published on July 14th in the New York Times, where he basically has this very sort of saccharine, laudatory uh, rendering of the life of Thurgood Marshall and the impact that he made. And it was really effusive about his liberalism, his ability to, you know, cross both sides of the aisle, for lack of a better term. Um and, you know, he mentioned his anti-communism in passing. But for you, this really, the way that this article was written really represented some of the fundamental problems that uh, are facing not only Black people generally, but the sort of issues of the, what I call the niggerati, the Black elite more broadly. So can you, can you just give your perspective on this article and what you found to be interesting or problematic? Well, first of all, the article begins with... Thurgood Marshall, I believe, in the late 1950s, when he's at the height of his influence as an attorney, getting in a cab and speaking to a cab driver. The cab driver asked him if he had heard about this recent court victory. And of course, Thurgood Marshall was the lawyer in the case. And Thurgood Marshall grunts, yeah, he heard about it. And the lawyer and the cab driver says something like, oh, Martin Luther King did it again. Now, mm -hmm. what readers might not have known is that Thurgood Marshall was not only dismissive of Martin Luther King Jr., which in many ways meant he was dismissive of the mass movement, but he was also yeah, dismissive yeah. of Malcolm X. And he apparently believed, as do many lawyers, I'm afraid to say, that uh, what led to these juridical victories beginning in the 1950s was not a changing international situation, which then drives mass protests. It was the wizardry of lawyers like Thurgood Marshall, which is the looniest idea since Looney Tunes. <laughs> that, that's part of the problem that we face today. Uh, th this idea that uh, these lawyers are going to be our savior. But it, it's actually deeper than that because it also, that article uh, inadvertently uh, bled into other controversies. He talks at another point about, I believe it was 1946, and Thurgood Marshall is fleeing right-wingers and racists in Columbia, Tennessee, and uh, he manages to escape. But what Stephen Carter does not tell his audience, and uh, I invite your audience to put these names into a search engine, is that he happened to be in a car with Harry Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D, who was a reporter for The Daily Worker, the Communist Party newspaper. And it's oftentimes suggested how these so-called Stalinists, they're black people out of history uh, when they don't necessarily uh, fit today's fashion. Well, that was a clear example. Put Thurgood Marshall, Harry Raymond, and Columbia, Tennessee into your search engine and see what you find. And that's also part of a larger story, which is about how post-World War II, you have U.S. imperialism is under pressure, not least because Africa is surging to independence along with the Caribbean, but they have this domestic problem of black people in particular being treated so atrociously. And this creates a dynamic uh, 
whereby the U.S. ruling elite is forced to retreat from the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow, leading to the compromise of 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which says, you know what, we looked at the 14th Amendment a bit more closely and carefully, and we've decided that Jim Crow violates the 14th Amendment. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the sort of hocus pocus the lawyers usually engage in, as opposed to looking at the larger and wider context. But of course, part of the bargain, part of the compromise, because a compromise means you give up something, is that it narrowed the ideological space in Black America. That is to say, coming out of World War II, there were these three ideological trends. On the one hand, there was a kind of Black nationalist trend, but it was on the back foot because many of the Black nationalists were pro-Tokyo. In fact, I've written two books about it. Here's one that was uh, translated into Japanese, a race war. Mm -hmm. white supremacy and the Japanese attack on the British Empire. Then I did Facing the Rising Sun, which goes more into detail about uh, how these black nationalists were pro-Tokyo. That's where the Asiatic black man con concept comes from, was mm -hmm. the pro-Tokyo or orientation. But of course, many of them were jailed <laughs> during World War II, and uh, they were on the back foot. Then you had the liberal trend, as represented by those who are still with us and have ideological hegemony, uh, speaking of the NAACP leadership, which is now branched off into a kind of civil rights leadership that includes the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Urban League, the National Action Network. But they were not necessarily the most influential trend. The most influential trend, if you go back to 1945, was probably the left-wing trend, as represented by the great Paul Robeson. Certainly he had more credentials and more global authority and more domestic authority than anyone else. But as a result of the Compromise of 1954, the Robesons and his comrades were tossed overboard, and that creates an ideological vacuum. In fact, you, you see the same thing happening all over the world. I mean, if I could digress, I could talk about uh, Afghanistan, where mm -hmm. now you see the religious zealots uh, on the march, not least because beginning in the 1970s, U.S. imperialism uh, helped to weaken, then undermine the left-wing forces led by mm -hmm. the People's Democratic Party. If you want to see something gruesome, uh, put into your search engine Najibullah, N-A-J-I-B-U-L-L-A-H, circa 1992, and watch if you can stomach it, the zealots not only lynch him Negro style, but castrate him. He was the last left-wing leader in Kabul. So this is the dynamic that that article by Stephen Carter uh, elides. And then even more dramatic is the fact that Stephen Carter uh, has a personal stake in this because one of his closest relatives, the late W. Alpheus Hutton, was one of Robeson's closest comrades. Hutton, of course, was also jailed during the dark days of the 1950s because of his left-wing attitude. Uh, he was the leader, along with Robeson, of the Council on African Affairs, which was the leading uh, organization in the country pushing for decolonization, pushing for anti-apartheid. They were driven out of business by 1956. Hunt is forced into exile with Du Bois to Ghana in 1963. The coup in Ghana in 1966 leads him to camping to Sekou Toure's Guinea Conakry. And then it was from there to Zambia, where by mm -hmm. 1970, uh, he passes away as Kenda Kaunda, uh, one of Africa's giants, the leader of that Southern African nation, weeps at his graveside. And that's one of Stephen Carter's relatives, interestingly enough. And so there's so much that's uh, problematic and yet revealing, revealing in its omissions about that article. And what's interesting, too, is that Stephen Carter is a law professor at Yale, and there hangs another tale, which is that, as we all know, there is this demagogic attack right now on critical race theory, mm -hmm. um, which in many ways is reminiscent of the 1950s Red Scare. There are rational attacks. There are ludicrous attacks. Things are swept into the ambit of critical race theory that have no reason to be there. Critical race theory, for those who may not be familiar, was a movement started by law professors. And I have to say that I had a stake in this because as it was being launched, I was in the legal profession and uh, I knew many of, of the founders. In fact, 
a, the late Derek Bell, of Harvard Law School, who was a mentor to Barack Obama at Harvard Law School, if you look at my book on Southern Africa, you'll see an exchange between myself and Derek Bell that I reproduce because he was reprimanding many of us left-wing lawyers for being so concerned about international affairs and international events, <laughs> which makes it ironic that critical race theory sets itself up as some sort of left-wing alternative to mainstream legal eagles like Stephen Carter and also Randall Kennedy of Harvard Law School as well. And then likewise, there was more than a whiff and an aroma of capitulationist anti-communism in critical race theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at the law review article by Kendall Thomas of Columbia University Law School, uh, a charter member, president of the creation of critical race uh, theory, uh, where he uh, takes a, this, this, this strikingly anti-communist line with regard to the Scottsboro case of the 1930s, which I've argued in a number of books was really the turning point in terms mm -hmm. of the struggle against Jim Crow because it internationalized Jim Crow and lengthened the battlefield of Jim Crow. Uh, mm -hmm. That is to say that uh, it led directly to the retreat of Jim Crow two decades later in the 1950s. And so <laughs> what's interesting, so you have these critical race theory folks who set themselves up as a left-wing alternative, but yet they don't have any critique of Thurgood Marshall. And in fact, they are more idolatrous in some ways than Stephen Carter with regard to Marshall. And Carter mentions in the article that supposedly, you know, Marshall, he, he was anti-communist, but he gave a pass to the Hollywood 10, the communist writers and screenwriters. Uh, who who you wrote a book about? Of course. <laughs> Who were forced to walk the plank, but but what's interesting <laughs> is that Thurgood Marshall was one of the leading anti-communists in the NAACP, helping to purge Du Bois, for example, in 1948, and trying to give him this new identity. Really, barely passes the the giggle test, and so I think that what this is reflective of, I'm afraid to say, is the ideological confusion. Mm -hmm. in, in Black America, uh, we have yet to recover from these purges that took place in the 1950s that narrowed ideological space, leaving us with these uh, liberals in, in a kind of hegemonic position and a kind of Black nationalist trend on the other. Now, with regard to the liberals, what's interesting is how they miscalculated. You have uh, Eddie Glaw at Princeton University confessing in, in a recent book that he never thought white, white America would vote for Donald Trump. By white America, I assume he means Euro-Americans across class lines, who of course, but if you pay any attention to politics, Euro-Americans across class lines have been voting for the right ever since the 1960s. And in any case, what it bespeaks is one of the liberal flaws, which is a failure to study not only the current correlation of forces, but the history that leads up to the current correlation of forces, starting, for example, with settler colonialism, because if he had looked at the origins of settler colonialism, which basically involves class collaboration, that is to say, a poor Englishman in the first instance coming to what is now North Carolina in the 1580s, sponsored by the 1% of London, I mean, it's class collaboration from the beginning. And so you which you which you wrote about in Donnie the Apocalypse and Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism and Counter Revolution of 1776. Absolutely. And so in, instead of doing the study, they basically accept these uh, liberal nostrums. And you see this also in the miscalculation with regard to Obama. Many of our liberal friends were tell particularly Euro American liberals, were telling us that the election of Obama in 2008, uh, it inaugurates this rosy dawn of post-racialism. It's a step forward with regard to the struggle against white supremacy, when actually uh, anybody who would study history would recognize that it was actually triggering. <laughs> it was triggering for many of the Euro-Americans who then revolt in 2016 and vote for Donald J. Trump, give him 75 million votes in 2020, and may return him to the White House in 2024. And so because of this failure to do an analysis and just accepting these liberal fairy tales, it's led us to the precipice, the brink of catastrophe, 
and I would add more, one more, uh, two, uh, actually two more points, is that uh, this, this, the, these failures are also represented, I'm afraid to say, in what's considered to be the uh, <clears throat> apex of African American studies. Speaking of uh, Harvard University in your own Massachusetts, Dr. Brown, where they actually paid a handsome sum, sum to Sean Willens of Princeton University to give these lectures that he eventuated in the book, No Property in Man, which puts forth this fairy tale about how the Constitution, which any high school student could tell you, uh, talks about black people basically in terms of representation, con constituting three fifths of an individual, a fugitive slave, slave clause for forcing uh, folks in the North to return the enslaved property to the South, 12 of the first 15 presidents being slave owners, but somehow this was an, an anti-slavery document. Now, if the history department at Harvard had sponsored that, I could say, okay, but why is African-American studies paying this guy all this money to put forward these fantasies, these fairy tales? It bespeaks clearly ideological confusion, which leads me to my final point for the time being, which is that one of the central aims of the U.S. ruling class, which they accomplished in the Compromise of 1954, was to detach Black Americans from the Caribbean and Africa and those liberation movements. And you see this, for example, I talk about this in my book on Southern Africa, when the NAACP, along with Ralph Bunch, the former left-wing Howard University professor, who then climbs the greasy pole of success, becoming the uh, leader of the United Nations. And of course, somebody should do some research into what happens in historic Palestine and the mm -hmm. late 40s. Yeah, he when brokered that. Supervisor, Count Folk Bernadotte, the Swedish diplomat, is blown up by the Zionists. Bunch takes his place, and therein you see the unfolding of the Palestinian tragedy. By the 1950s, of course, he's conspiring with the NAACP to try to flip leaders of the African National Congress to become CIA agents. <laughs> part of the, this detachment of uh, black Americans uh, from the uh, liberation struggles, which of course reaches a kind of zenith uh, in the early 21st century, when you have uh, the government of Zimbabwe moves to reverse the fruits of settler colonialism by seizing the land of the European minority, some of whom hadn't shown up until 1945. That's in my book, From the Barrel of a Gun, by the way. Mm. And what's interesting is that even though the African neighbors of Zimbabwe are against the sanctions that the United States imposes as a result of this land reform, uh, even though most of progressive humanity is against these sanctions, you have members of the Congressional Black Caucus, including uh, some of the so-called most progressive members who support sanctions, which makes it very difficult and problematic for us to then appeal to the United Nations to investigate this reign of terror that the police have inflicted on our community because uh, they, they don't see us as, as being credible. And so uh, I, I think that uh, what I've tried to outline in the last few minutes in some ways are the kernels of the dilemma that we face, which is also represented in the fact that even some of the liberals who look at the uh, testimony of the four police officers in the insurrection of January 6th, who testified a few days ago in Capitol Hill, Congressman Raskin of Maryland, DC suburbs, Tacoma Park, he raises the F word, fascism, uh, in terms of what may be in store. You have writers in the New York Times making a similar analysis with regard to the cult of personality ar around Agent Orange, for example, the lies and denial about January 6th. In fact, the New York Times, in an article the other day, used the phrase, quote, party line, unquote, with regard to the Republican Party. I only thought that it was communists with a, a party line. So that shows you how things are in a state of flux. And what's interesting is that even though black people will be an early victim, if and when fascism right, and don't come to talking about this stuff while we survived slavery. You didn't survive slavery. You weren't around in 1865. 
I did survive Jim Crow. I was around during the Jim Crow period, and it, it was no walk in the park. And fascism makes Jim Crow look like a day at the beach. But the question is, why isn't there a discourse amongst black intellectuals, leaders, and organizations about creeping fascism when our community is bound to be an early victim mm. of this pestilence? Instead, we have people seem shocked and surprised that uh, Donald Trump would be elected or giving hefty five-figure sum, sums to Princeton professors to put forward propaganda at Harvard about the Constitution being an anti-slavery document, or uh, Stephen Carter uh, somehow uh, singing a lullaby to the memory of one Thurgood Marshall. I, I hope and I trust we can do better than, than this. <laughs> I'm a hope with you. <laughs> but, you know, it, it it seems like one of the things that makes it very difficult in the context of the U.S. to really have a robust analysis is the kind of um, I don't know the obfuscation of class, right? And so one of the things that um, you kind of hinted at, but I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about are, are is the nature of sort of class contradictions um, and class collaboration and how that shows its face in particular as it relates to US history. Because I think a lot of times um, narratives about race and how race map onto our ideas about class obscure, I think, real genuine analysis of class. And so I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about the, the necessity of understanding class, both contradictions and collaborations as it pertains to U.S. history. Well, class collaboration could be seen as the central aspect of U.S. history. And what's interesting is that there has been an attempt to impute class collaboration to our ancestors, even when it was not necessarily prevalent. What I mean is, is that if you look at the founding of this so-called republic in the late 18th century, it's imputed to our ancestors that the enslaved actually stood shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with the slave owners, which would be one of the most egregious aspects of class collaboration that you can conjure up. But of course, that was not the case. In fact, you can make an argument that one of the reasons we've been treated so atrociously is precisely because we did not engage in class collaboration, that that continued post-1776, post-U.S. Constitution, uh, up to and including August 1814, when the British invade Washington, D.C., uh, putting the White House to the torch, sending James Madison, the president, and his garrulous spouse, Dolly, fleeing into the streets one step ahead of the posse, with the Africans, of course, joining the Redcoats in this immolation of this city that they despised, Washington, D.C., and then getting on boats and being transported to British soil in Trinidad and Tobago, where their descendants continue to reside. Uh, that's disgusting. Negro about comrades of the crown. Thank you very much. And, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> and of course, you know, th th this this opposition to the ruling elite it had to continue. I mean, why should we collaborate with slave owners so that we could oppress, be oppressed further? Or why should we collaborate with the uh, formulators of Jim Crow when they are tightening the shackles on our wrists. Now, of course, with the Compromise of 1954, things begin to change because uh, with the Compromise of 1954, uh, you see uh, a number of Negroes who are able to climb the greasy pole of success. And that leads, of course, to some of these debacles I've just made reference to, such as Harvard African-American Studies and some of these uh, other Ivy League debacles. And what happens, of course, is that the best one can say is that these Negroes try to cut a deal with the liberal elite of the United States of America. Now, the problem there is that the liberal elite does not necessarily have ideological hegemony in what uh, our friends refer to as white America. Uh, that helps to explain 75 million votes for Donald J. Trump. That helps to explain why any even Euro-American women voted heavily for Donald J. Trump. 
And so where we are right now is that the liberal elites cannot necessarily save themselves, let alone us. What, what I mean is that when left-wing parties uh, have a purge, they oftentimes use the euphemism renewal. We're renewing, we're renewing our ranks. So as you see the growth of the right wing in the United States with creeping steps towards fascism, uh, on deck, possibly, is a, quote, renewal, <laughs> I'm afraid to say, of really the top ranks of the U.S. Uh, ruling class. In other words, there will be purges. Uh, you, you see this already with regard to policy towards China, because obviously, as we talked about before, the United States really bungled policy towards China and helped to create this juggernaut that's in the passing lane. And so now there's serious talk in Wall Street parlance of those in the 1% who have heavy investments in China having to take a haircut, which means having to sacrifice their profits mm -hmm. in, in favor of geopolitical ambition. So the, the point is, is that this uh, alliance, this de facto reliance upon the liberal wing of the U.S. ruling elite, which many in the civil rights leadership broker, uh, it has not worked out very well. In fact, uh, one could say that it was always built upon a mound of sand because it was dependent to a certain degree upon the continuation of the ideology of the Earl Warren Supreme Court. <laughs> but if you go back and look at the billboards from the 1960s with impeach Earl Warren, pock marking the landscape, there should have been a recognition that that was a foundation built on a mound of sand. And of course, many of our law professors who of course were, 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 were critical, uh, starting with Thurgood Marshall, in terms of, of, of forging this alliance with a reliance upon the law, the rule of law, reliance yeah. <laughs> on the courts, for example. But now, where are the courts now? I mean, I don't have to remind you of how uh, Mitch McConnell refused to uh, give a pass to Merrick Garland after Antonin Scalia uh, passed away. And then Mr. Trump appointed uh, Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett with now uh, all of our rights on the chopping block, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, supposedly the crown jewel of the movement uh, has been gutted with, I'm afraid to say, little prospect of being reinvigorated uh, and of course, there's been criticism of President Biden uh, for not being more forthcoming and forthright with regard to that. But to speak directly to your inquiry, uh, this present catastrophe that we're facing is due in no small measure to a kind of class collaboration that emerges post-1954 uh, on behalf of the civil rights leadership who, after all, they do take away certain premiums. I mean, for Thurgood Marshall is appointed to the highest court, professors getting in, endowed chairs. You have uh, some becoming uh, dollar millionaires, a, a handful becoming even dollar billionaires. But for the bulk of our community, it's the prison industrial complex. It's a cessation of the moratorium eviction evictional moratoriums is going to create a cascading number of more homeless, for example, with hunger being still a dire reality in this country. So at a certain point, it seems to me that when you look at this dismal landscape and dismal scenario, the reasonable person should try to ask, well, how did we get to this point and what can we do to reverse this point? as opposed to doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, which as they say in the United States, that's one definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but I, I, I just want to say the Democrats did do a moment of silence for the eviction moratorium. So they are doing, they're doing their part. Moment of silence. <laughs> um, so, you know, as you know, you said a reasonable and rational, a reasonable and rational person would ask, like, how do we get here? So 
Can you sort of trace the transition from religion um, to race to class in the last 500 years? And <laughs> what does that actually mean for black Americans? And how can we do something different and not keep doing the same thing and getting the same results? Look, we got the, we got the hands like, oh, this is what we're doing. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> well, no, this, this is one of my favorite subjects. Um, <laughs> As you know more than most, it, it was the subject of my book on the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Because once again, you really have to go back post-1492 to this European invasion of the Americas, followed by the liquidation of the indigenous population and the kidnapping of Africans and bringing them across the Atlantic to work for free. Mm -hmm. As we all know, Spain had the first mover's advantage. And of course, Spain had sharpened its military skills for fighting seven to 800 years against Arabs and Muslims who would basically uh, control the Iberian Peninsula up until that hinge year of 1492. And therefore, when they invaded the Americas, uh, they were able to come with all guns blazing. And of course, they were Catholics. We all know that approximately 500 years ago, you had the secession from the Catholic Church led by Martin Luther. For various reasons, uh, the Protestant, what used to be called the Protestant sect, uh, takes hold in London. London, the people whose language we are now speaking, <laughs> uh, had little incentive to go along with Catholicism, even if you set aside Henry VIII's ostensible reason for breaking with the church, that is to say his divorces, and the church not putting its imprimatur on his, on his divorces, because the Vatican had basically divided the world between Spain and Portuguese, you know, the Treaty of Tordesillas, which I'm mm -hmm. sure many of your listeners know about, viewers know about. And so what happens is England, as London begins to try to feast at the banquet of settler colonialism, there were not necessarily enough Protestants to go around because it's a sect. Mm -hmm. Spain had engineered that religion should be a qualifier for settlement. And so as late as the 19th century, when Stephen F. Austin and his band of pirates make a deal with Mexico to settle what they call Texas or Tejas, they had to profess Catholicism, at least nominally. Spain were the Spanish leaders, the Spaniards were religious sectarians. Uh, that's where the Inquisition comes from, where you had to profess Catholicism or be torched or put to the sword, which is the fate of many Muslims Mm -hmm. in the Iberian Peninsula and the fate of many Jewish people as well on the Iberian Peninsula. Interestingly enough, London had expelled its Jewish population in the late 13th century. And yet, when the time comes for settler colonialism to flourish, uh, London opens its doors to the Sephardim and other Jewish folk who are fleeing the Iberian Peninsula not necessarily because they were more enlightened. This was a product of enlightenment, which is what the, the bourgeois scholars tell us. They needed all the warm bodies that they could muster. And of course, that leads directly to the fabled and vaunted First Amendment, uh, religious liberty, mm -hmm. uh, because it's really sort of a, 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 an entente, a settlement uh, between and amongst uh, re religious believers in Europe, which then brings me to the seeds of whiteness and or white supremacy, uh, you could trace the seeds of white supremacy in many different ways. Uh, you actually trace it back to the origins of Christianity 2000 years ago and the quote othering of the Jewish population in particular, you could trace it back to the crusades approximately uh, 900, a thousand years ago, a millennium ago uh, with the attempt to put to the sword Muslims in what the Christians call the Holy Land. But in any case, what happens is that by the 1500s, uh, London, not necessarily because of enlightenment, needless to say, but out of pragmatism, 
it begins to move away from religion as a qualifier for elite status and settlement to race, that is to say, othering the Negroes, for example. Mm -hmm. In the early pages of my book on the 16th century, uh, I, I talk about the parallels between how Jewish people were treated in London at the end of the 13th century before they were expelled and how black people eventually were treated. That really, be, in many ways, becomes the, the template, and not to mention how the Irish are treated and how the indigenous of North America are treated, or even how the Scots were treated. But what happens, is that they're all invited to the banquet of the colonial feast and in a maneuver that would make Madison Avenue blush. Once they cross the Atlantic, they adopt this new politics of identity, that is to say whiteness. Eventually, uh, the politics of whiteness is extended. Those who have been warring on the shores of Europe, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian, the East, the list is endless. Magically, they're transmuted into this new identity politics of whiteness, which becomes the winning ticket over religious sectarianism of the Spanish, which helps to explain why we Africans are now sitting here speaking English, for example. But then a fatal breach occurs with the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. This administers a staggering blow to the race project. And... Uh, Britain quickly adapts by seeking to bring more, seeking to stop bringing more grave diggers across the Atlantic, speaking of enslaved Africans, to Jamaica and Barbados, abolishing slavery in 1833, 1834, 1830s. The United States digs in his heels, but the dynamic is against the United States. And of course, civil war explodes in 1865, which then leads to the abolition of slavery. And then, of course, you know, these white supremacists are stuck with all these millions of Africans on these shores, and they tried to adapt by forming the system of Jim Crow, uh, creating a, a, a sort of domestic purgatory for our ancestors. But then in the early decades of the 20, 20th century, you have the rise of, rising of the class project with the Bolshevik revolution, which then attracts uh, many of the more sophisticated elements in our community particularly like Paul Robeson, Shirley Graham Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Claudia Jones, uh, et cetera. And uh, it's a worldwide movement. And as Afra mentioned, it puts enormous pressure on the United States to adapt. And the United States, as noted, makes the compromise of 1954, but as noted that narrows the ideological space because the, the, the class project advocates are tossed overboard. And I should also say a word here about the other ideological trend that emerges, which is the black nationalist trend, which in some ways is meritorious compared to the liberal trend, but it has its weaknesses too. I mean, in my book, uh, Black Liberation Red Scare on Ben Davis, I talk about how approximately 60 years ago, in, in a very important manifestation, you have many black nationalists. You can go to YouTube and watch it. They invade the United Nations after the U.S. CIA sponsored killing of Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. Very militant black nationalist manifestation. But interestingly enough, they try to bar Paul Robeson's comrades from the demonstration. <laughs> and then the international, the Africans look at that and say, well, what's up with that? I mean, and then, and something I was involved in, and I've written about in the book White Supremacy Confronted, when you have the Angola crisis of the mid 1900s, mm -hmm. and of course, many of us are Angolan, whether we know it or not, because it was a happy hunting ground for enslavers. So, <laughs> as, as I suggest in my book, Facing the Rising Sun, perhaps because they thought that Maoist China was a replay of uh, Japan in the 1930s and 1940s, but Maoist China had cut a deal with US imperialism against the Soviet Union. From the black nationalist point of view, they I used to have arguments about this with people. It was white Washington and white Moscow versus mm -hmm. China. Even though it was clear to anybody who read the newspapers <laughs> that China was collaborating with US imperialists. Now they, they cut a sweet deal. I, you know, I'm not hating on China, and they, they got a good deal out of that. But still, with the Angola crisis, of course, you had China, apartheid South Africa, and US black nationalists lining up 
against the ultimate victorious party in Angola, the popular movement. MPLA. MPLA. The Cubans, who thank goodness intervened to save the bacon of the Africans, who of course were funded by the Soviet Union. Now, I remember having arguments. How can you side with apartheid South Africa? And, and actually, that's one of the things on a personal note that helped to drive me in, into history. Because I said, you know, arguing with these people, it, it, it's sort of a fool's error. It's, it's sort of a waste of time. Because if people are not persuaded by facts and reasoning and argument, I might as well spend my time in the archives uh, mm. trying to write history so that the next generation that emerges uh, can learn from this history and not replicate the mistakes of the generation I was now experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so in a nutshell, that's the transition from religion to race to class. But now, of course, we saw we see the class project has, has suffered staggering blows. And unsurprisingly, you have the resurgence, recrudescence of religious sectarianism. I mean, that's the story in Africa and northern Mozambique, where Islamic State is on the march. Northern Nigeria, where Islamic State is on the march, the Sahel, mm -hmm. uh, Mali, Niger, for example, where the Islamic State is on the march, uh, Afghanistan, where, as noted, uh, Taliban is on the march. And of course, <laughs> you know, many of our black leaders, intellectuals, and organizations were either quiet as these trends were developing over recent decades, hiding under their desks when people were asking them questions, or they were complicit, as in the case of the NAACP leadership, which, believe it or not, supported the war in Vietnam. And that's one of the reasons why Thurgood and the, all these other folks were so critical of Martin Luther King, because not only did King oppose the war in Vietnam, he had the audacity and temerity to maintain a relationship with Jack O'Dell, mm -hmm a former member of the U.S. Communist Party, a former National Maritime Union mm -hmm. rank and file sailor, uh, a former chairperson of the board of Pacifica Radio, who Kennedy invites King into the Rose Garden to escape the surveillance of FBI Director Jagger Hoover, tells King to get rid of Jack. King says he will, but he doesn't, which then leads to all hell breaking this. Well, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm thinking, you know, you, you've taken us around the world again in mm -hmm. less than 40 minutes. But if, if I could bring us back into the contemporary moment just a bit. Um, um, August, we would be remiss if we did not at some point in time have a discussion about political prisoners. Um, and one of the oh. things that's interesting um, coming up, you know, for our audience who obviously is following us and as a part of one of the sort of initiatives of Black August in the sort of Black left community is to, you know, fast, rededicate ourselves to study, but also to continue to interrogate the nature of the sort of global prison industrial complex, complex and the treatment of, of political prisoners. And one of the things I think that's often obscured is, is the way political prisoners, one, exist in the U.S. context um, and also their treatment. So I believe it's a coalition of a number of different organizations, the Jericho Movement, um, I'm forgetting some of the names of the other ones off the top of my head, um, who've come together um, in the spirit of, uh, what is it, the campaign to bring Mumia home, incarcerated workers, um, organizing, and then, oh, the Leonard Peltier Defense um, Committee are coming together in October and have asked the United Nations um, to be a part of this process of initiate of, of in, what do you call it, imposing or making sure to implement these rules of treatment that were have been based on the sort of mistreatment of Nelson Mandela when he was in prison. And so I wanted you to actually speak a little bit to some of the issues, contradictions, or concerns that may come up. Um, in the way we are attempting to help ask the UN to help us in the international community think about uh, human rights violations and the, the mistreatment of political prisoners in the US context. Well, that's a very important point to raise. And <laughs> fortunately, it gets, it gets us onto a more positive track, which is something that I welcome. Um, 
And I'm glad you raised the international context because, as I might have said a few moments ago, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations is now embarked on an investigation of police terror in the United States of America. And this comes in the wake of a number of left-leaning lawyers, including uh, Lennox Hines, a former Rutgers professor and a lawyer in New York, uh, who spearheaded an independent investigation, issued a report that you can find accounts of in the London-based Guardian, along with a 188-page report. And I would dare say that that helped to spur the United Nations, uh, suggesting uh, how we still have my previous words notwithstanding, uh, this progressive core uh, in the United States that is continu continuing to push ahead. Uh, speaking of political prisoners and speaking of what I've said for the last uh, 45 to 50 minutes, I would be remiss if I failed to ignore the pivotal role of the Black Panther Party, uh, mm -hmm. which rises in California in the 1960s, uh, maintains relationships with William L. Patterson, uh, for example, and Harry Bridges of the International Longshore and Warehouseman's Union. Uh, but alas, uh, comes a cropper, not least because of police terror, uh, which then sends many of its leaders into exile, into exile in Algeria, North Africa, but also sends uh, many uh, Black Panther leaders and those within the ambit of the Black Panthers into exile in Cuba. Uh, Foremost on that list, of course, would be Asada Shakur, um, who, of course, uh, has roots in the United States of America, New Jersey in particular. And uh, North Carolina. Oh, <laughs> right on. And um, of course, um, the US authorities have not given up on that fervent desire uh, to snatch Asada Shakur and bring her back to the United States because of allegations that she was involved in alleged misdeeds against mm -hmm. the New Jersey state troopers. But I should also mention in this context as well, Rochelle McGee. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a campaign uh, on behalf of Rochelle McGee, who if I'm not mistaken, has been in and out of prison for the last half century. Mm -hmm. and I think he's the longest, he's the longest remaining political prisoner mm -hmm. since the jail has passed away, yeah. Most likely that is the case. And of course, there are websites and movements on his behalf. Rochelle is R-U-C-H-E-L-L, McGee, M-A-G-E-E. -E. You should plug his name into a search engine to get uh, more detail about the campaign to free Rochelle McGee. You may recall that uh, he was at least tangentially involved in what happened approximately uh, 50 odd years ago uh, when Jonathan Jackson, the younger brother of George Jackson, and George Jackson was a field marshal in the Black Panther Party, uh, incarcerated in California. Uh, his works, Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye, are still worth studying. Uh, Jonathan Jackson at the Marin County Courthouse tries to liberate a number of prisoners, and he is killed as a result, and Rochelle McGee, of course, is blamed because he was in the courtroom at the same time, which leads to an exaggeration of his original sentence. And then, of course, ultimately, uh, George Jackson himself was killed. Uh, and there is there is a footnote I, I should add towards the John Jackson George Jackson killing that some investigators should look into. What I mean is is that the official story was that. Uh, his lawyer, Jonathan Bingham, accompanied by a woman who I then knew as Vanita Witherspoon. I understand she has a different surname today. Uh, a company goes into the prison. Somehow they get a pistol to George Jackson. Who he sticks in his afro and then tries to have a shootout. Now, of course, that sounds like science fiction. But in any case, uh, it's a very curious episode. And I understand, you know, I, as I said, I, I, I was in California at that time. I knew Benita. I think she's still in California. But it's, a, it's, it's something that needs investigation. 
by one of our uh, crack researchers uh, in uh, Black America. And I would also say that with regard to campaigns, which you noted, uh, we should also note the campaign that had been directed against the majority stockholder of the Detroit Pistons basketball team, who's profited handsomely from these prison telephones, which is one of the, the biggest hustles of all time, uh, whereby these prisoners have to pay an arm and a leg to use a pay phone. And then this guy profits. And then I, I, I'm not trying to put the Detroit Pistons basketball players on the spot, but Sometimes three dollars an hour. I mean, three dollars a minute. That's it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they just drafted Kay Cunningham, um, a Black American from Oklahoma State, as their number one draft pick. And I saw an article in the Detroit Free Press the other day who says that Kay Cunningham is the most sophisticated player the Detroit Pistons have ever recruited. So mm -hmm. I hope he's sufficiently sophisticated to tell the owner <laughs> that he should at least sell his stuff, mm -hmm. if not lead a crusade against the looting of these prisoners. Period. Absolutely. So, okay. Um, I want to sort of circle back. I guess I want to ask sort of many questions in one, and then you could just, we're, we're um, reaching the end of our time here. And so I wanted you to speak about when you say compromise of 1954, what exactly do you mean? We know you're referring to Brown versus Board of Education, but what was the compromise? Mm -hmm. And what was its impact on weakening of uh, both the labor left and the, you know, the black movement more, more broadly? And then how does that relate to how class has operated and has been taking up within the, the sort of long black liberation movement? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, how might this relate to why it is that Black folks are so, <laughs> have, have no sense of, of rising fascism mm. uh, and have sort of, you know, no sense of, are, and are too reliant on the liberal wing to, mm. um, to our peril? Well, the compromise of 1954 is basically in return for baby steps towards eroding Jim Crow. And of course, it has not been eroded to this very day, uh, almost 70 years later. There would be a tossing overboard of the black folk who had a class analysis, a class come race, come gender analysis, more precisely, uh, led by the great Paul Robeson flanked by Claudia Jones and Shirley Graham Du Bois, for example. Of course, she's eventually uh, sent back to Trinidad and then to UK, where she becomes a leader of the Black community there. You have Ferdinand Smith, uh, who A. Philip Randolph notwithstanding, was probably the most powerful Black trade unionist in the United States. He was a founder of the National Maritime Union, the sailors and deckhands who had control over imports and exports. Mm -hmm. Roots in Jamaica, of course, I'll preempt you by saying you see my book on Ferdinand Smith, the Red Seas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, of course, is sent back to Jamaica, where he becomes a leader of the independence movement in Jamaica that culminates in Jamaican independence in, in 1962. But the routing of Ferdinand Smith is just emblematic of the routing of left-wing labor. And so what that means is that Black people, because of the baby steps away from Jim Crow, uh, win the right to check into certain hotels or eat at certain restaurants. But because we're mostly a working class population mm -hmm. and depend upon the collective organizing of unions with the weakening of unions, which is mm. congruent with this whole period. Look at the Taft-Hartley Act yep. of 1947, the Landrum Griffin Act of 1950s. You see the weakening of unions, uh, which means that we have the right to these hotel rooms and ho restaurant meals. We don't have the, the money to pay for the bill. And that's mm. the very curious outcome. Now, of course, when, once again, uh, there were some who were able to profit handsomely because they were not necessarily dependent 
upon trade union organizing. If you are an entrepreneur, for example, if you are Robert Smith of Vista Investing of Colorado, who of course just forgave the loans of students at Morehouse, which by the way was just a <laughs> attempt. Yeah, a ploy to, <laughs> to polish his reputation because he's about to go to jail. But hey, I'm not hating on the brother. You know, he, he forgave the well, loans. He forgave Cosby the got loans. Out, so. What'd you say? I said, well, Cosby got out, so maybe that was a goodwill to sort of give himself a leg up in that way. Right. So, so there, there are elements coming out of 1954 that were not necessarily reliant upon collective organization. And unfortunately, were you about to say something? I just want, but but then there also were folks like A. Philip Randolph who were, um, you know, who are uh, in collective organizing and still abetted in that process. That's very true. Um, and uh, A. Philip Randolph has gotten to pass. <laughs> They are Rustin too. A. A. Philip Randolph is a bum after like 1918. Period. And Rustin has definitely gotten the pass. Him and uh, Randolph. Um, but that, that's another story for another day. Another story. Sorry. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. But but obviously, what this has meant has been weakening our community ideologically, as fascism creeps ahead steadily with the primary victims, meaning us, being apparently unaware of what's going on, not least because we have been ideologically denuded. And uh, obviously we're going to have to uh, push the emergency button because we can't go on like this. I mean, um, this reliance upon the liberal wing of the US ruling class has come a cropper because as I said, they can't necessarily save themselves. I mean, some of them are about to be purged. So how are they gonna save us? They can't even save themselves. And so it's it's time once again to re-examine history, to reinvigorate internationalism, to renew our relationship with the Caribbean community and with the African Union, uh, to apologize. I, I think that we should our leaders should apologize to the African Union for supporting sanctions against Zimbabwe. I think the NAACP should invite uh, Robeson's surviving granddaughter, Susan Robeson, to their next convention and apologize as the 125th anniversary of the birth of Paul Robeson approaches within a year or two. I think that it's not too late to try to repair to engage in a kind of eternal reparations, uh, which of course would be a conditioned precedent to forging ahead on the kind of reparations that we keep being instructed that we're demanding, although absent some sort of international push and international alliance, I think that the cry for reparations really in some ways becomes just another confidence game mm -hmm. uh, with hardly any substance behind it. So speaking of renewing or recommitting ourselves to um, a kind of internationalism, uh, earlier when you were talking about Ralph Bunch, you kind of hinted at, but I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more to this, um, the role of the, uh, of the eight, what is it, the... The, how did I want to talk? I want you to speak to the ways black leadership helped to recruit ANC leaders for the CIA because you hinted at that earlier. And then, as we're sort of staying in the international realm and thinking about even the roles of sort of black leaders and black intellectuals, um, what what do you think it is that continues to inform a number of black intellectuals' reticence to really have um, an internationalist view? Um, in particular, like in this moment, it's really obvious you, you already kind of spoke to it to China and we've previously had a conversation about what's happening in Cuba. Um, but what's really interesting um, in this particular moment with Cuba is the way people are not aware of the role, again, that the CIA and the U.S. government has played in exact in using these sort of like black either either sort of internal racial contradictions or even hip hop artists right in Cuba in the same way that the CIA used 
Dizzy Gillespie and ja and jazz artists in the in the Cold War era as a part of the Jazz Ambassadors tours to sort of shape their international um, the image of them internationally. I wanted you to help us think about the importance for us as intellectuals, as academics, as Black folks in the U.S. Of this sort of expanding or recommitting ourselves to a particular kind of internationalism. Oh, can I, just to add on to that Cuba question, and is it we, why is it that so many huh, Afro Cuban, what one might call Afro Cuban gusanos, <laughs> have ended up in U.S. universities and colleges? Um, and does that relate to this whole the whole question that that uh, Layla laid out? Well, let me take your, your latter point first. Of course, you're probably familiar with the Gatario who was the leader of the Proud Boys, who was this fascist group uh, that was prominent on January 6th. He's Afro-Cuban, for example, a proud Afro-Cuban at, at that. But to go back to the, 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 the beginning of the thread, with regard to Ralph Bunch and the NAACP trying to flip ANC leaders, there's correspondence in the NAACP papers. These folks, they had the nerve to, to write this down. <laughs> There's correspondence in the NAACP papers. If you go to my book, White Supremacy Confronted, look up Ralph Bunch in the index, then turn to where he's mentioned, and then you'll see the where you can find the letters. Because, of course, I give a precise designation. Give those instructions again, because I have to do that with my students every semester. <laughs> look in the index. <laughs> look at the name. <laughs> Read, and then also look at the footnote, because I yes. can't find the document. <laughs> right, that's one thing. Look in the index, then go to the text, and then look at the footnote. It's yeah. a three-step process. <laughs> and then you, you can find, as a matter of fact, here's an easy publication credit. Um, the Journal of African American History, they, they used to publish documents all the time. They don't publish them as much anymore. But that would be a very interesting annotated document to publish. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to go to the Library of Congress. You could get one of their staff to send you a PDF of the document. And then, you know, write a little annotation and then publish it. You know, it's easy publication credit. But in any case, once again, uh, this is redolent uh, of a larger e ideological construction, a larger ideological crisis. That is to say, once you throw in your lot with the liberal wing of the US ruling class and detach yourself from African and Caribbean uh, liberation, well, of course you're going to uh, do this. And uh, this, of course, was very helpful to Mr. Bunch. Interestingly enough, if you look at the biographies of Ralph Bunch, uh, I'm not sure, I'll let you make of this what you will. But the biographies oftentimes say that Ralph Bunch, in terms of diplomatic negotiations, was cool as a cucumber, unflappable, et cetera. But at home, he was a holy terror with regard to his family. And of course, one does not have to be a psychologist to draw a connection between those two personas. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to internationalism, I mean, the problem is it took a long time to dig ourselves into this hole in which we find ourselves. And so it won't be like making instant coffee where you just throw a, a teaspoon of coffee in the water and put it in the microwave. It's going, it's going to be an uphill climb, I'm afraid to say. And to use another analogy, another metaphor, you know, if you don't use a muscle, it tends to atrophy. And we have not used that internationalist muscle for quite a while because of these alliances with the liberal wing of the U.S. ruling class. Mm -hmm. As I said, they, can't even, they, they may not be able to save themselves, yeah. let alone save us, which then brings us to Cuba, which you mentioned. Uh, Netflix has this documentary, I think it's called 638 Ways to Kill Fidel Castro. And it talks about the hundreds of plots uh, against the Cuban leadership uh, mm -hmm. over the years and over the decades. And one would be foolish to imagine that those plots have ceased, which then, of course, brings us to uh, Biden foreign policy with regard to Cuba, which is following Trump foreign policy. Some might say even outflanking Trump foreign policy. But once again, I think that it's a direct result of our leaders and organizations being missing in action with regard to foreign policy. 
not exerting pressure on this man who says that he owes a debt of gratitude to the black community because black voters in South Carolina basically uh, saved his scalp during the primaries. And as long as that's the case, <clears throat> we're going to see a repetition of these sorts of tragedies, such as uh, Biden foreign policy towards Cuba. And as a footnote, I'm happy to see that Mexico has sent yeah. massive aid to mm -hmm. Cuba. Bolivia has sent massive aid to Cuba and Russia has sent massive aid to Cuba, Cuba which should uh, stave off the wolves at least for a, a short period of time. Now you also mentioned music and there hangs a tale. You know, I wrote this book, Jazz and Justice, talking about mm -hmm. uh, how the United States through the voice of America uh, tried to throw dust in the eyes of the international community by pointing to this music we call jazz mm -hmm. as an exemplar of US democracy mm -hmm. because there are these collaborations between and amongst these various musicians on these various instruments and yet they come up with a certain kind of harmony and that's mm -hmm. supposedly a metaphor for democracy. Of course, what they didn't mention was a number of things. Number one, the- Organized crime. Organized crime, racism, <laughs> you know, killing musicians. Not to mention, as I pointed out, that in terms of the mu music being inherently democratic, well, what does that say about Benito Mussolini, who was a fan of the music? And in fact, his son was a noted jazz pianist, for example. So there goes that theory. Well, the U.S. ruling class loved Mussolini, though. Like, they actually really loved him. He was much more popular than Hitler was among the ruling class, They especially because he crushed labor. He crushed labor and the communists, so they loved him, so... Yeah, there is a book uh, that was written some years ago by John Patrick Diggins on the uh, love affair between U.S. intellectuals, U.S. ruling class, and Benito Mussolini, not least for the reasons that you've articulated. And once again, you can go to your search engine and you can find a very graphic depiction of Mussolini uh, being executed Mm -hmm. by anti-fascist patriots as World War II lurches to a close. And let that be a grim reminder to some in the U.S. ruling class that if they're not careful, their plotting towards following Mussolini's path might likewise end in such an inglorious manner. Mm, except for that it was the quote unquote fascist that showed up on January 6th with the guillotine, not the left. So well, they are going to get guillotined, right? But it's just going to be, it's going to be by the, it's internecine period. So anyway, okay. Well, that point brings us back, you know, to the original point that you made that we have to continue to both in, in being able to reinvigorate our commitment to internationalism, we also have to take more seriously class analysis. And we can't keep doing this work that says that some kind of race analysis is a substitute for class analysis. Well, that's for damn sure. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, period. Well, Dr. Horn, thank you so much. As always, you drop so many jewels people we have to watch your interviews three four five times to take notes and then everybody's always blaming me for all the money they spend ordering your books um because you know your books are the blueprint and especially like when you read across them like you offer much of what we need to know um you know and then suggest projects and homework for other of us to continue on with the threads that that you provide. So thank you so much. And it wasn't an exaggeration when we say you're a fan fave. Everybody in the chest. <laughs> well, and, and, and just one reemphasizing one point, really fish out of the Library of Congress that Ralph Bunch, Walter Document. White correspondence about flipping the ANC and publish it. Oh, okay. We will do. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you so much.